So hey, uh, maybe we've never met before. I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Brandon. Uh, I'm Pastor Galen's youngest son, uh, 24 years of age. Maybe you're new to Copper Point Church today, and you're looking at this guy like, this, he's super young. Well, I want to tell you, there's a guy that preaches here uh, much older than me more often. He's the guy that you'll see just much, much older than I am. But um, I'm just messing. That, it's my dad. Love you, dad. You're awesome. Um, hey, give it up for Pastor Galen and Kay. They're awesome people. Appreciate you guys. But uh, I'm just, I'm, thank, Dad, you gave me the mic. I appreciate that. That takes a lot of trust. Yeah, don't take it back. He wants to take it back. Don't do that. Uh, I'm not going to, I'll run. I'm faster than you. So um, <laughs> I think at least he's got that old man like strength and speed to him. But, um, but <laughs> he does. They like old dudes. They just are strong. I'm just calling you old a lot. Young men. He's a young adult. He comes to wake. Um, but I'm pastor's youngest son. I also happen to be uh, our college and young adult pastor here at Copper Point Church. So, yeah, um, shameless plug, if you're like 18 to young adult, um, you can come hang out with us on Thursday nights. Quick note, though, we're off until January 9th. So if you show up, you will be lonely and sad. So don't come until January 9th because we won't be here. Um, I'll be, Asher Woodward's in a play next week, Thursday night. So I'll be there and you'll be here without anybody. So don't come. Um, and then also I, I have the, the privilege to be a part of something we launched in September called Copper Point School of Leadership. And uh, that has just been an incredible ride to be on and something to be a part of. And the, the thing I love about this is that we have taken some, some young students some people that are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, even 60s, 60s, people that feel a call of ministry on their life. And so we are... Um, just basically training them as much as we can through an inter internship program. And they're also taking classes through Champion Center College in the Seattle area. And here's what I love about this is that we are training them up, not to just keep them here, but some of them we will be sending out to other parts of this state, other parts of this country, and other parts of this world because we don't just believe in the vision of this church, but we believe and buy into the vision of the church all across the world, across this country. And as much as it might hurt us to have some of them leave us, uh, we're going to be so willing to send them out because we want to see God use them and God move through their life, not just here at Copper Point, but we're going to spread this thing throughout the country and throughout the world from something we started here. And so uh, if you have any interest in that, we'll be launching a new school year in September. So be paying attention this spring and summer as we talk about that. Um, but those are my shameless plugs. I have the mic. I can talk about what I want to talk about. But um, last week... Uh, our pastor, my dad, he, he jumped into John 3.16 and he preached on the first six words of John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit, uh, recap his message, but I, I remember he just talked about this one verse. You know, people talk about how it is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's an incredible verse. Many people would consider it to be quite possibly the greatest verse in the entire Bible. If you had to just keep one verse, if you could only take and keep one verse from the entire word of God, many people would take John 3.16. Because in their mind, they're thinking, I can, I can preach the gospel with John 3.16. I can show somebody that God loves them with John 3.16. I can show that Jesus came and that if we believe in him, that we, we can spend eternity with the almighty God, the creator of the universe. John 3.16, guys, is a powerful, powerful verse. And, and I'm thankful that we get to hear the, these messages three weeks on this one verse because we want to bring the power of John 3 16 back into your life or for some of you bring it into your life for the very first time and so it's a very popular verse it's made its way into popular culture and in, in many ways into our everyday life um, how many of you guys by the grace of our wonderful God have eaten at in and out Burger in your life has anybody been to God's favorite restaurant well Chick-fil-a is his favorite this is his second favorite so um that's in the Bible. No, it's not. Okay. in and out Burger. Has anybody never been to in and out Burger before? Would you be willing to admit that? Shame. No, I'm just kidding. Um, here's what, when I'm done preaching and we close out the service, I would like for you to leave and get in your car and just drive west and you will run into an in and out Burger and you can thank me next week, okay? in and out Burger, though, you may, you may or may not have noticed on the bottom of every cup at in and out Burger is a reference to John 3.16. Pretty cool, right? 
Has anybody eaten there and you're like, I never saw that before, you didn't know that? Quite a few people. Next time you go, you don't spill your drink, just like hold it up. Uh, John 3.16 on the bottom of one of the most popular restaurant, uh, fast food restaurant chains, chains in the country, if I can get that out. And then also, uh, are there any young ladies or maybe middle-aged women that want to stay Forever 21? Um, there's, a, there's a store called Forever 21. Anybody shop there? You guys like that store? Yeah? Somebody, any guys that like that little 10 by 10 section for us? Yeah? The girls have the whole mall. We have like, like bumping into each other. Like I buy a jacket and everybody else has that jacket because there was three of them, you know? Yeah, that's fun. Love that. They're not sexist at all. But anyway, Forever 21, on the bottom of their bags, you may or may not have noticed, is a reference to John 3.16. Forever 21, this thing is around the country. It's going around the world. People obviously see a value in just putting a reference to John 3.16 because I believe they think if somebody would just maybe look this up, if somebody would maybe just Google this this reference, if they would just type it in on their on their search engine in their in their internet and just type that in, that maybe they could see the gospel story. Maybe they can see Christ through that. Maybe they can see God's love for them and maybe it could change their life. Who, who knows? John 3, 16. Then, you know, there's this popular football player. Um, I forget his name. Um, no, I'm just messing. Tim Tebow. Anybody, any Tebowites in here? Tebowians? Okay, I'm not one. Uh, anyway, I'm an Alabama fan. I don't like Florida Gators. I apologize. Roll Tide. But anyway, Tim Tebow, I, I respect the guy. And he would do this in, in these big nationally televised games. How many of you guys have ever seen Tim Tebow with John 3.16 on his eye black? So here's what's cool about this. He, he knew that if he did this, it, it would start a little bit of commotion, that the commentators would talk about this verse that's on, under his eyes, that you know uh, people would be writing about it, people would be offended by it, other people would be really happy about it, but he knew it would get people talking. And here's what's crazy. Wikipedia reports... I believe it was either the SEC championship or the national championship, but Wikipedia says the next day after one of these nationally televised games, there were over 187,000 references to John 316 and Tim Tebow in blogs and articles. How, how cool is that? I think that's pretty amazing. And also, uh, Google shows us that John 316 was the top search on Google for the following three days. Just because somebody put... A reference. Obviously, Tim Tebow believed that there is, there is power if somebody can just look this up. Would somebody just type this in on Google? Would somebody just open a Bible they maybe have never opened or not in a really long time? Somebody that doesn't believe God loves them. Somebody that doesn't believe that God would give anything to them. And he believed in, in Forever 21 and In-N-Out Burger and many other people in our country and in our world believed that if somebody could just understand John 3.16... They might be saved. They might have an understanding of who God really is in their life. So this is obviously an important verse, guys. And it's more than just a verse. This is a truth. It is a life-changing, game-changing truth. But it will only be life-changing if you can have it seep into your spirit, if you can internalize it, and if you can personalize this verse. Because I believe Satan, to an extent, has allowed this verse to become somewhat of a cliché. That he's allowed it to be something that a lot of us just kind of gloss over. We just, you know, just glance over it when we're reading our Bibles or when we see a reference to it. It, it doesn't mean anything to us anymore. And I'll be honest and just open with you guys. When I heard that we were going to spend three weeks on John 3.16, I was like, really? Like, we can't pick something like that nobody doesn't know already? You know, and, but that's the trap that we've fallen into. We think that, you know, John 3.16 is a cliche. Everybody knows it. Everybody should know it if you don't already. But... There is so much truth in this one verse. We're going to spend three weeks talking about it. We already talked about it last week. You're going to hear about it this week and next week because we believe there is power in this verse and what Satan has allowed to become a cliche, we want to take back from him and we want to regain the power that is in this verse. Some of you guys are going to hear this for the first time today. Others of you know this. Well, I would challenge you, if you know it already, Take notes today. Learn something new today. Let this be fresh to you today. Let it energize you and excite you to take this concept and this truth outside of these walls. And you go tell somebody else that God loves them. You go tell somebody else that God gave his only son for them. And if they believe in him, they can have everlasting life. Let's make this fresh today. And so uh, I want to do this. They're going to put the ESV translation of John 3.16 up on the screens. 
And uh, I'd like for you guys to read this out loud and follow along with me. All right, participate. I will be watching you. Um, let's just act like we're back in third grade. Is that cool with everybody? Is that you guys okay? Third graders, yeah? Okay, here's what we, John 3, 16. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Somebody say amen to that. It's good stuff. I don't even have to preach. I could just walk off stage right now, and there you go. But I'll preach a little bit. Hey, if you guys would, I want to uh, start off the crux of today's message by praying. So if you guys would pray with me today. Father, we thank you so much uh, just, just for the ability to be here this morning. Lord, we thank you that we woke up to your new mercies today. Your mercies are new every single morning. And God, we're just thankful that we can be a part of this church, this body of believers, and that we can worship you together. We can encourage each other, that we can hear your word brought forth. And I just ask that you would remind each and every one of us, including myself, that these are not the words, that these are not the thoughts of some 24-year-old preacher, but these are your words, that these are the words of the Almighty God being brought forth. And we know that when the word of God is brought forth, it never returns void. And so help us to change today, God. Help us to learn. Help us to leave here better than we walked in this place. And we thank you so much, Lord. And I ask that you would allow me to decrease on this stage, Lord, so that you might increase in the eyes of every person in this room. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And also, guys, my prayer today is that we would, we would regain the significance of this verse today that we would leave having a better appreciation and a new understanding and a better, and a better understanding of the, of the significance of this verse. And so last week, Pastor opened up and he talked about those first six words, for God so loved the world. And to me, that was an incredible uh, message. You know, I sat on the second row over here just being, I was just so encouraged by what was being said. I left with, with a reminder, with a renewed appreciation of God's love for my life, of how much God loves me. That's what pastor's goal was last week, to tell you God loves you. It is, you cannot dispute it. You cannot argue against it. It is a truth. It is a fact that God loves you. He talked about how God's love is universal, which doesn't mean that we're universalists. It just means that God loves everybody. And he talked about how God's love is, it's unconditional, that you don't, you never are, are loved less by God. And guess what? You're never loved more by God. That's offensive to some people. Like, obviously God's going to love me more if I, if I do better, Brandon. But that's exactly the point. He loved you the same in your good state that you might be in now. He loved you the same now as he did when you were in your worst state you were ever in. God's love for you is already at its max. It never decreases. And guess what? It never increases, which I wanted to remind some of you of today so that you could stop trying to earn God's love. It's already there. It already exists. You can't work harder for it. It will never increase. It will never decrease in your life. And, and pastor also told us that God so loved the world. That word world is, is, is the Greek word cosmos, which doesn't mean the, the actual physical earth. It doesn't just mean like, you know, the, the nice people, the saintly people. It means the ungodly multitude. That's who God loved. He loved the ungodly multitude enough to give. He loved the ungodly multitude enough to give his only son and to sacrifice him on our behalf. And so I want to continue today. We'll move through John 3, 16 a little more here in a minute. But one of my favorite preachers, I was watching a message from him the other day. He defined love as this. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. He defined it as unceasingly selfless action. Unceasingly selfless action. I think that's one of the greatest definitions of love. You know why? Because love is it's action. Guys, love is not an emotion. We get caught up in a society that tries to teach us that love is that feeling you get when somebody's with you and you just feel bubbly on the inside and you got butterflies and whatever people call it. Like, it's not an emotion. Love is an action. Love is something that is, is shown. Love is something that is to be put on display. You can actually see love. You can actually prove your love. Love is an action. And then also love, it's, it's selfless. Love is love is okay, I love you, so what I'm going to do is, if I truly love you, I'm going to put your needs in front of my own. Love is selflessness. It's not about what you can get out of the, the situation. It's not what you can get out of the relationship. It's what can the other person get out of the relationship because you're in it, and you're so willing to serve them and make their life the best it can possibly be. It is selfless, and I love this first part, that it's unceasing. we got a culture of people that believe you can fall out of love. That is the furthest thing from the truth. 
You cannot fall out of true, genuine love. And we believe that we can fall out of it like, yeah, I just, you know, we've been at this for a couple years. We've been at this for 30 years. And I just, you know, Brandon, I just don't, I don't love them anymore. I fell out of love. What I would challenge is either you never love them to begin with because love is unceasingly selfish, selfish action. Some people think it's unceasingly selfish action. Unceasingly selfless action. It never ends. And for a lot of us, we believe that because our love can end, we think that our love can end, it causes us to think that the love of God can end in our life. It messes us up in thinking that, yeah, yeah, I've had love come to an end. I've had love just stop. So we think that God can just suddenly stop loving us. But guys, love doesn't stop. No matter if it's good, no matter if it's bad, because I want to remind you, no matter if you're doing well or you're doing really poorly, God's love never stops for you. So our love cannot and never, never is able to stop for other people. It cannot stop. It is unceasing. And that is love. It's this idea of don't tell me you love me. You got to show me that you love me. Don't just tell me. You know, I'm, I've been married almost 11 months now, which is kind of crazy. Like that went by really fast. Somebody kind of like halfway up. You can applaud for that. Like nobody thought it was going to happen. Thank you. Appreciate that. Almost 11 months now. And um, here's the thing. Like my, my wife, she, she keeps the house pretty clean, and I'm very appreciative of her for that. Thank you for that, by the way. She keeps it very clean, and, like, the, the, house, the home is her sanctuary. Like, she comes home from work, and that just, it's just like, I'm in my sanctuary. Like, it's clean. There's, I counted. This is not, an, pastors exaggerate. This is not an exaggeration. There were 17 candles lit in our house the other day, like, all different scents. Like, it was like sensory explosion when I walked in. But she's just in there, like, basking. The house is spotless, and she's just, like, in her zone. And here's the thing. Her house is no longer a sanctuary when my shirt is on the ground. Like, you know, I'll get home and I'm just like, I'll take my jacket off. Like, oh, it's going to be so complicated to hang this back up. So I drop it on the ground. (laughs) That's what goes through my mind. And it goes on the ground and suddenly the home is not a sanctuary anymore. Suddenly it's like a pigsty and everything is, life is done as we know it. Everything is over. Like, I just, I can't live here. We have to move. This house is a wreck. I'm like, pick up the, the jacket, and it's like sanctuary. You know, it's, it's, it's bad. It's her sanctuary. But here's the thing. If I, if I just do that every day and I don't pick up my stuff, if I'm not constantly picking up my things and, and helping her, you know, if I don't do my part and do the dishes sometimes, if I don't help clean and help vacuum, and, and, not, and sometimes I need to do it without being asked, right? I mean, that's, that's what she wants. She's like, I don't want to ask you to vacuum. Just be like, man, I should vacuum. That's never crossed my mind, but I'm praying, like, God, just drop that thought into my brain, you know? And I'm convinced I'm still a 24-year-old boy, because, like, I think you become a man when you start picking up your own stuff. I'm on my way. I'm in that transition period. Uh, any ladies can say I'm into that? Any of you guys married to boys? Don't, don't even. You're going to cause problems. But... I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn this, but here's the deal. So we'll sit down and have these conversations. Like, she'll, she'll sit me down and be like, Brandon, I just, I feel like you don't care. You, you, don't, you don't care about our house. You don't care about my, my sanctuary. She doesn't say that, but you don't care that I, I work hard and I, and I cook some, and I cook and I clean and, and you just aren't doing your part. It, it tells me that you don't care. And stepping out of this for a moment, I'll be honest with you guys, I, I do care. It's never an issue of me not caring, but to her, that's what it seems like and feels like. So jumping back into this conversation, she's telling me that, and I'm saying, no, 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 I, I do care. I promise you I care. That's, you can't tell me I don't care. That's, that's not fair. And she says, well, those are just words, Brandon. I need to see some action. I need you to show me that you care. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so I know all the ladies are like, you understand. And I'm sorry that you understand. We're working on it, guys, are we not? We're working on this? Hopefully. She doesn't want me just to tell her that I care. She wants me to, to show her that I care. And the same, th- same way with love. I can tell her every day, hey, I love you. But if I don't help pick stuff up, if I don't leave notes for her, if I don't, help, if I don't have a job to help provide for her, if I don't put her needs in front of my own and actually show her that I love her, she's never going to believe that I love her. And to tell you the truth, if I'm not doing those things, then I would say I probably don't really love her like I think I do. Love is something that is to be shown, is to be on display. And so here's what I want to tell you today is that God's love for the world was not just an emotion. It was not mere sentiment, but it led God to action. And it led him to a specific action of giving us his son in Jesus Christ. God didn't just want to tell you that he loved you. Last week we learned that God 
loves us. You cannot dispute that. But this week, I want to not just tell you, I want to continue in this verse and I want to show you that God loves you. God wanted to put his love for you on display so that it would not just be mere words. So jumping back into John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave. Everybody say, that he gave. For God so loved the world that he gave. My ESV Bible has a, a footnote that says, you know, some of the earlier manuscripts worded it like this, for this is how God loved the world. And what's the following words that he gave? So God's giving is what makes it clear to us that he loves us. Does that make sense? God's giving to us in his son with just maybe anything that you have in your life, just in general, that giving in your life is the direct result of God's love over your life. That is the result of God's love. He has a giving nature. God has a nature of love, is what we learned last week, that God doesn't just love, he literally is love. And so when you feel the love of God, he's not, he's not loving you. Really, you're just finding yourself caught up in the love of God that is in all things, is all things, is everywhere, because God is love, and God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. So guess what? God's love is everywhere. It's everywhere at all times. It's easily accessible. You just have to open yourself up to it. But also, he's not just love. God is literally, his nature is that of giving. He has a giving nature about him. I'll prove this to you. Uh, I've got these verses won't come up on the screen, but you can write down these references. It says this in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift. Everybody say free gift. The free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord. He gives you eternal life. That is just a gift from God. We don't work for it. We don't earn it. John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. If you need peace in your life, guess what? God is never going to be the one that takes your peace. He wants to give you peace. And it actually ends this verse by saying, not as the world gives do I give to you. Because guess what the world gives? The world gives us problems. The world gives us more burdens to, to bear. The world is, is what's gonna give you terrible advice and gonna make your life even worse, make you think things that aren't true, things that aren't really happening. The world is just gonna add on to your life and never in a good way, and I love what it says, that I don't give to you as the world gives to you because guess what? God doesn't give to us like that. That's the stuff that God takes from us. He, the only thing that God will ever take from you are your burdens, your cares, and your sins. That's what he wants to take. Everything else he is giving to you. He wants to give you peace. He wants to give you love. He wants to give you eternal life. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Ephesians 2, 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Something interesting is that even the, the faith that we need to have to believe in God, did you know that faith is a gift that comes from God? You can't even believe in God unless he gives you the faith to believe in him. And then the grace that comes along with, you know, that after we have faith in God and we believe in him, the grace that comes along with that over our life is a gift of God. James chapter one and verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, anybody sitting next to anybody that lacks some wisdom, Okay, good. Nobody really raised their hand. That's smart. Whew. Oh my gosh. I was going to, you're the one that doesn't have wisdom, right? Okay. But I drove here today. I know there are people in this city that lack wisdom. Yeah? Some of you guys. I saw the Copper Point sticker. Yeah. Praying for you. So if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously. Everybody say generously. I'm having you repeat this stuff because I want you to internalize it. I want you to understand this and grasp it. He gives generously to all without finding fault. It's not that God's like, man, you're just dumb and you've messed up way too many times, so I'm not gonna give, you don't deserve wisdom. You need wisdom over a situation. You ask for wisdom and guess what? He gives it to you. Not, not depending on how good you've been, not depending on what you did yesterday. He gives it to you without finding fault. So if you need wisdom in your life right now, I know a lot of people in this room probably do. Have you asked God? He wants to give you wisdom. Matthew chapter six and verse 33 says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What he's talking about there is just a few verses earlier. Jesus is saying, don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. He's basically saying, don't worry about the things that you're going to need in life. He says, just seek my kingdom. Seek me and seek my righteousness, and those things will just be given to you. 
You know, a lot of us, we have needs in our life, and rather than seeking out the, the person that's going to provide and, and give every need that we possibly could ever have, we chase after the need. We know we need a better job, so we just take it upon ourselves to work harder, to work longer, and that's how I'm going to get the better job. I need a better relationship, so we just seek out, like, you know, our own, you know, what, what can I do to make this relationship better? What can I do to, to fix this? You know, we, whatever we need in life, I just need more money. So you seek out your own avenues of getting money, and God's saying, don't, don't do that. Seek my kingdom and seek me first, and, and how about I just give you those things? How about I just give you a better relationship? How about I just give you the, the, the money that you need to help you in this financial situation? I don't want to have to earn and work so hard for the things that I need in life. I would rather seek God first and allow him to give me the things that I need in life. It's a better system. It's a better avenue. He gives because of his love, and I believe God gives out of his love. The book of 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9 says, In this the love of God was made manifest. In this, the love of God was made manifest. That word manifest just means obvious. So the apostle John is, is literally saying, guys, the love of God was made obvious that in, in that he sent, in that he gave. So look in, look in your life. What are the things that you have? What are the things that you possess that you would consider to be given to you by God? And that's not even thinking about the grace that you've been given the forgiveness that you've been given, now that you've been given the, the opportunity to have eternal life, but even beyond that in a physical sense, what have you been given? And he says, look at all that stuff, and it should be obvious to you that God loves you because of what he's given to you. It is the love of God should be obvious by looking back at the coming of Jesus Christ. So in this, the love of God was made obvious among us that God gave, that he sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. Which leads me to the next part of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You know, I have this weird thing. I'm going to admit something weird this morning or today, whenever, whatever time it is. But I have this weird phobia of bad breath, okay? Um, yeah, somewhat from you toward me, but more so me toward you, okay? I never want to be that guy that's known behind closed doors as like, dude, Brandon's got like halitosis, man. Like, breath is rank. I can't be near him. Like, I just can't, I can't handle that thought. Like, so if you've ever said that about me, don't tell me because that hurts my feelings. But I can't handle that idea. And so if we're ever having a conversation and I'm like backing up from you a little bit, it's not because I'm trying to get away from you usually, okay? It's more so that I probably just think like, oh, I don't have gum today. I'm, I'm going to get away from you. Like you're, first of all, you're like a foot from my face, which makes me uncomfortable. Don't do that. And, but you're like, I call those people space invaders. They're just like, in your space, you know, don't like that, but I'm like backing up because I have this phobia of having bad breath, so with that being said, I always carry gum with me, almost always, okay, so right now I'm kind of indicting myself as a gum carrier, don't take advantage of that, all right, Jesus would not do that, all right, do not use and abuse, all right, so I normally have gum on me, and so I'll go buy a new pack of gum, I've got five gum, that's my favorite, I've got 15 pieces of gum in this pack, and I'm that guy that's like, man, I got 15 pieces of gum. I'm like on top of the world. Got a fresh pack of gum in my pocket. Nothing can take me down. And so I'm like, I'm in my friend's circle and somebody walks up and is like, hey, anybody got a piece of gum? I'm like, hey man, I got a piece of gum. Here you go. Like I still got 14 pieces of gum left. And at that point, I'm just like offering gum. Like, hey, you need some gum? You need some gum? I'll give you some. I'm like very generous because I've got a lot of gum. But what happens when it gets down to one piece of gum? You're not getting my gum. Okay? So that same scenario uh, you know, I've got one piece of gum, and I know it's in there, and somebody walks up to my friend's circle and is like, hey, anybody got a piece of gum? I'm like, I don't have any gum, you know? And then I'm like ratting out other people, like, this dude always has gum. Go steal from him. So if people have asked you for gum, I've probably sent them to you, so I apologize for that. But, so here's the thing, has, has, anybody, um, has anybody ever been the recipient of the one, the final piece of gum? Has anybody ever been that recipient? There's like four people. Now, another question I want to ask have, have, do any of you guys carry gum on you? Like normally, you just carry gum, you carry something like that. So a lot more people carry gum. And this is, kind of, this is the human condition, okay, right here. All y'all carry gum, but we're never willing to give out our last piece of gum, okay? So I walk up, I'm like, anybody got gum? You got one piece of gum, you're not giving it to me. Because here's the thing, if, if you give me your last piece of gum, that like shocks me. I'm like floored. And in that moment, I'm looking at you with like, we're friends forever. You just... <laughs> 
you just gave me your last piece of gum. And at that point, I'm like, we're planning stuff we're going to do 60 years down the road. Like, I'm going to be at your funeral, or you might be at mine, depending on how that, you know, works out. And, or like, if it's somebody the opposite sex, and you're both single, and they give you their last piece, that is your spouse. Like, that's them. <laughs> that is God showing you their, that's them. They just gave you their, because it's like shocking when somebody gives me their last piece. Like, I'm like literally floored. Like, and, and if I give you, like, I think the only person I've ever given my last piece of gum to is my wife, like one time maybe. And that's how selfish, and normally I just like rip my last piece in half and give her half. <laughs> like, I'm like 50% generous, okay? I'm like, yeah, I love you halfway, you know? So that's how bad I am. I'm like, I won't even give you my last, I'll, like, I'll give you like a fourth of my piece of gum, maybe, if I don't lie to you and tell you I don't have any, okay? So here, but here's the thing, it's, when I have a full pack of gum, it's easy to give because I've got a lot, but it's one thing to give out of your abundance, but I believe it's an entirely different thing to give out of your poverty. When you don't have a lot, it's so much harder to give, so much harder to give. There's, there's a story in the book of Luke chapter 21 where Jesus and his followers are, are watching this, this scene take place, and there's these religious people that have a lot of money that are putting, they're in the temple in Jerusalem, and they're putting a lot of money into the offering collection box, the tithe collection box, and People are just amazed by these guys, like, oh my gosh, they're giving thousands of dollars. That is incredible. People are very happy with them. They think they're awesome. And so Jesus is just standing there watching, and all of a sudden, the, the story, the narrative of Luke tells us this widow walks in and gives into the offering collection box what most scholars believe would be the equivalent of two pennies. She just gives that, and everyone's just like, oh, you know, they don't really say anything about it. Nobody's impressed by her like they were impressed with the other guys, but Jesus grabs his followers, noted, noting that they didn't recognize what had just taken place. So he gathers them around. He says, guys, we were impressed by these guys that gave the thousands, right? And they said, yeah, I mean, that was, that was insane. He says, well, I want to tell you, that widow gave more money than they did. She gave more than they did. And everyone's looking at Jesus like, dude, you're crazy. Like, what happened earlier? Did Peter hit you over the head, you know? And, but he looks at him, he says, look, they, they gave a lot, yeah, but she gave all. She gave everything. This poor widow, the Bible tells us that those two cents, that was all she had. She gave everything. It is one thing to give out of your abundance, which is, a, that's good, give out of your abundance, but it is an entirely different thing, giving out of your poverty. And I read a quote recently that said, God judges us by what we, uh, judges what we give by what we keep. God judges what we give by what we keep. She didn't keep anything. She gave everything everything. She didn't hold anything back, and that is what God wants to see from us. Not that every time you get a paycheck, you got to dump 100% of your paycheck in, but have you ever given to the point where it hurts a little bit? And not just of your money. Have you ever given of yourself? Have you given of your time and your energy and your resources to the point where it's not just, oh, I had 20 of these, so I gave away a few, but I had 20 of these, and I gave away 18 of them, and I only kept two, and that hurt, but I also knew that God has called me to be somebody that gives have you ever given till it hurts? And so I'd say all this because this is exactly what God did for us. It's not that he had 10 or 15 sons. It's he gave his only son. He didn't take one of his thousands of angels and say, hey, I'll just, I'll just use one of you guys. I got plenty of you, so we'll send you down to earth and you'll just solve this sin issue for us. No, he, he gave his only son. He gave his only. And good thing I'm not God because I won't even give you my last piece of gum. But he gave his only son. And I wanted to show you that today, that not, not only does God just love you, but he loves you to the point of action. And not just, it doesn't just stop there, but he loves you so much that he gives until it hurts. He gives his only, he gives his best, he gives the most, more than any of us can ever even fathom or imagine. God gave his only, there was no backup, there was no spare, which kind of leads us to this thought. Okay, God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And that, that sounds awesome. Okay, God gave us his son, but some of us stop there and we don't really understand why. Why, why did Jesus come to the earth? You know, why do we celebrate Christmas? Why, why did he have to die? I hear about this brutal death all the time. What really took place here? And, and it all stems back to one thing, and that one thing is sin. So you have to know that God's first creation, uh, human creations, Adam and Eve, they literally walked in the presence of God. They walked hand in hand with the creator. They could see him. They could, they could talk to him. They were living in direct community with God. 
but sin crept its way into God's perfect creation and God's perfect order, and it just wrecked everything. And, and you also have to know that God is a, is a holy and perfect God that cannot be near sin. God cannot tolerate sin. Sin is literally the antithesis of our God. And so when sin entered this world, it didn't just... It wasn't just that Adam and Eve sinned, it's that sin became a part of them. It latched on to them physically, it latched on to them spiritually. And there was a rift that was created between God and man because of the sin that was now on their life. And so the Bible tells us that now all have sinned, all have fallen short. So now we're all in that same place. We're all in that same state. Even when we're born, we're not born into this world good and then we're corrupted by this world. We're born already with that sinful nature on us. So guess what? We're born already in need of a savior from day one. We already need Christ from day one. And so everybody all have sinned. But the Bible also tells us in Romans 6 that the wages of sin is, is death. And so here's what needed to happen. For us to reunite with God, there had to be something that would happen that could permanently remove our guilt and condemnation of sin. Something had to take place. And so the wages of sin is death. Removing guilt equaled death. Something had to die. And that's what you see in the Old Testament with these guys having to sacrifice their best sheep, their best goat, their best ram, whatever it was. God, there needed to be blood that was spilled. Something had to die in order for there to be a forgiveness of sin. And that's why they did that in the Old Testament. But here's a beautiful part of the gospel is that we now all possess that guilt and that shame and that condemnation, but God did not want us to have to die for that guilt. He did not want us to have to pay the punishment for being guilty of our sin. And so that is when Christ steps into the picture. That's when he comes in because we all stand, before we are reconciled to God, before we look to Jesus as our Savior, we all stand guilty and condemned of our sin. We are in that sinful state until we look to Christ, until we look to him to be the salvation of that sin and we are in separation from God, but he did not want us to have to pay for that. You see, God has a wrath towards sin. God hates sin. Some people will tell you, some people will teach you that God hates you, that God hates the sinner, which couldn't be further from the truth. God doesn't hate anybody. For God so loved the world. Remember that? God doesn't hate you. God just doesn't like your sin. And it's not that just God hates your sin. Literally, God cannot be in unity with your sin, so something had to take place. And that is why Jesus Christ came into, into this world and he took our place. You know, we needed to be punished for our sin, for our guilt, for our condemnation, but he didn't want that to happen to us. So he sent his son to do that on our behalf. So I want to show that to you guys visually today. So if I could get Bob to come up on stage and then Dustin and his uh, son Aiden are going to come out here. Give it up for these guys as they come. All right. This is intern Bob. That's what I call him. He's uh, the college young adult intern, so we hang out like every day. Everybody waved to intern Bob. Wave. How you doing, man? You can't smile. Okay, you're going to ruin it. Okay. Bob here is a representation of me. He's a re representation of you. He's a representation of sinful humanity. Okay, this is pre-finding uh, Jesus as your Savior. Okay, pre-reconciliation, that's Bob. Okay, so he's, he, uh, he's a representation of all of our collective sins. He's an adulterer. He's a liar. He's a thief. You know, I saw him outside earlier by some of y'all's cars. Bob is a thief. Uh, Bob is a murderer. Um, I mean, he's a bad guy, guys. Intern Bob, just a bad guy, all right? But don't judge him because, remember, he's us, okay? So we're, this, is, this is us, pre-reconciliation. And so Bob is guilty of his sin. There is guilt in Bob's life. You see that on the screen? He is, he is guilty, all right? Bob, now, because he's guilty, like we were just saying, God has, a, has this wrath against sin. And here's kind of the, the part that... that is, I guess the sad part is, is this. Bob is guilty of sin, but remember, God doesn't have a wrath toward Bob. God has a wrath toward the sin in Bob's life, but if we never reconcile ourselves to God, his wrath happens to fall on Bob as well. They, they, they stay together because you're not separated from your sin. You have to separate from your sin in order to, for God to not have to pour his wrath out on your life. And so he's guilty, and Bob here, he deserves judgment. Bob deserves punishment, okay? So... I know, this is going to get crazy. So Dustin here, he's going to be a representation of God, okay? Don't let that get to your head, all right? I'm serious, don't, don't do that. Okay, so Dustin here is a representation of God. And 
what needs to happen is God is, is, is mad at, at the sin. He has his wrath. He can't be near it. He has to get rid of the sin. So Dustin here needs to judge Bob for his sin. So go ahead and judge Bob for his sin. Now, I'm just kidding. Okay, so you can pause there because the story gets better, okay? So he's hitting me with the bat. Should have chose somebody else. All right. So, but here's the crazy part. God in his weird, infinite love for us, I still can't figure that out, why he has such a love for me. But he didn't take it out on, on Bob. He didn't take it out on us. And he, he turns, and, but he also doesn't just take it out on his innocent son. Remember, this is Dustin's son, Aiden, and he is, he is innocent. So this is a representation here of Jesus Christ, God the Father and Jesus Christ. Aiden is innocent. Dustin loves Aiden. Dustin thinks Aiden, I think Aiden's awesome. Uh, he's known for being, uh, yeah, give it up for Aiden. You guys can wave to Aiden. Um, I like Aiden. I have a special... Uh, affinity for Aiden because he's very slow at like getting ready and getting anywhere. I am too. So we're homies, man. And I appreciate that about you. But so Aiden is Dustin's son who Dustin loves, who Dustin cares for. It's his oldest son. And, and I know Dustin would do absolutely anything for Aiden. But remember, this is a representation of God and, and Jesus Christ. But in God, in his infinite love for us, he decides to take our punishment that desert that belonged to us and pour it out on his son. But here's what the Bible says. It's not that he just turned and took it out on his son. He actually moves Jesus over to this area. And the Bible tells us that he who knew no sin became sin for us. He who was innocent, he came to this earth and he didn't sin at all. He didn't make any mistakes. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And now God decides to take his wrath out on him rather than on us, and I love what the Word of God says. It says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's not that Bob is over here on the innocent side, and that's why Jesus decided to die. It said while we were still sinners, while we're still under this guilty umbrella, Christ died for us. And so we read this story in the Gospel of Jesus hanging on the cross, and he's crying out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think we forget sometimes that, yeah, he was going through excruciating physical pain, and sometimes that, that's all we focus on is the physical, ah, like that, that had to have been so hard, that had, to have, that had to have hurt so badly, but we forget what was happening in the spiritual, that in that moment, Christ literally was becoming our sin, that every, every shameful act you've committed, every wrong that you've done, every sin you've committed, he took on himself and was feeling your sin, was feeling your shame, yours and mine. Everything we've done was on him in that moment. It, it didn't just stop there, but also, remember, God has a wrath on sin. So our sin came off of us onto Christ, and then God poured his wrath out on his son. The judgment that we deserve, the wrath that we should have felt, he poured it out on his son so that we wouldn't have to. And here's the crazy part of this story. Now, if we just look to the son and recognize that sacrifice that he made, and we recognize that he is the son of God and that he is our savior and we are in need of a savior. If we recognize that now for nothing that we did, for nothing that we earned, we now get to stand under here, under the umbrella of innocent for something that he did and that we didn't do at all. Something that we didn't earn. We now stand innocent and blameless before our holy God, which I think is pretty incredible. And so, hey, if you guys give it up for these guys, you guys can take a seat. Thank you. And I wanted to demonstrate that to you guys today because I, I love the visual of understanding that, look, we, were, we, we stand guilty until we look to Christ. And it is in that moment that we stand innocent. But also remember, it's by nothing that you've done. You don't earn it. You just look to Jesus. You just acknowledge what he's done. And you now have the, the gift of eternal life because God so loved you, God so loved me that he gave his only son. God poured out his wrath for sin on his son so it wouldn't fall on you. And you might be asking yourself, why would God have done that? And it all stems back to one thing. It all stems back to love. Because God so loved. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. For God so loved me. Make this personal today. Some of us make it this vague, ambiguous thing that it's, oh yeah, God so loved the world. No, guys, God loves you. For God so loved you that he gave. You have to know that if you were the only human on earth and, and sin was a problem and it had separated from you from God, Jesus still would have done the same if it was only you. For God so loves me that he gave his only son. And he would do something like that simply because of love, because of his immense 
love for us. And so in closing today, you know, we are, we are called as believers, we are called as Christians, the people of God, to be in active pursuit of God. We have to constantly be pursuing him and trying to get closer to him, trying to know more about him, trying to love him more. We're in pursuit of, of trying to experience the love of God more in our own life. But also while we're in the pursuit of God, we're also to be in pursuit of his character. And for a, lot of, for a lot of people, for a lot of time, you know, before Jesus came, this was a hard thing to understand, but God came in human form, and now we can just look to Jesus and look at how he lived. What was he like? What was his demeanor? Who did he spend time with? And we are in active pursuit of his character, of his nature, and we've talked about two things today, that God's nature is that of love, and I want to ask you today, are you a person of love? Is love in your nature? Is love really difficult for you? Do you struggle with loving people? Because the Bible tells us that uh, anyone that does not love does not know God because God is love. If you don't love, there's a, there's a chance that you may not know God like you think you do because that is his nature. And if, if you have God living and dwelling inside of you, then that's, that's gonna be radiating out of you, the love of God. Do you know God? Do you have that nature about you? And the second thing is that God has a giving nature. He so loved us that he gave. The giving was the proof of our love. And I believe that's why the Bible and the book of James and all of these other references in the Bible tell us that we should go and give to other people. We should give our money. We should give our time. We should give our resources because that giving to the world is the proof to them that we love them. That is the proof. That is what makes it obvious to them that we love them by how we give to them. Are we a giving people? When we come up and do the offering talk, does it frustrate you? Oh my gosh, God just wants to take from me. No, God doesn't take from you. Remember, he takes the bad things from you. He gives you the good things. But are we a giving people? Do we give to each other? Do we give to those outside of this body? We need to give like God gives to us. So as we are in pursuit of God, let us be in pursuit of his nature. And the last thing I want to say today is this. During this holiday season, what a perfect time to hear a message like this because this time of year is all about giving. A lot of us, we, we have felt very obligated recently to go buy gifts. You've been like rolling your eyes in the mall, like I don't even like this person, why do I have to buy him a Christmas gift, you know? And, and we just, we, we've, can I be honest, we've made the coming of Christ more about the coming of, of Santa Claus, which is, it's, it's crazy to me. And don't get me wrong, you know, you do, do the Santa thing, that's fine, we did it all growing up, but I want you to ask yourself, has that taken the place of the true meaning of what Christmas is all about? Is it about Santa coming or is it about Jesus coming? And I believe Satan is using that as a tool to get us, get our minds off of what this thing is all about. That we as Christians have even jumped into this thing too far at times. So it's not about that. And something I wanted to challenge you with is this, that Jesus, he set up communion 2,000 years ago. He told the disciples, this is my blood, this is my body. And we do that here at Copper Point Church to remember the sacrifice that was made. And I want to say this, as we give this holiday season, I want to challenge you with this. Give. Almost like, almost like it's communion. I know they're not on the same level, but give with this in mind that I'm giving to you as in remembrance of God giving Jesus Christ into this world. I want to give to you because of that. I'm not going to give to you out of obligation because it's Christmas and I feel like I have to. I want to give because I love you and I want to give in remembrance of God giving his son to us and not just giving him to this world, but giving him over like a lamb being led to the slaughter to die on our behalf. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever take it for granted. And so I want to pray. If you guys would bow your heads and close your eyes, I want to pray over you guys today. I want to just leave us with a feeling like we want to remember this, like we want to internalize this today. So God, we just thank you so much again for, for today. God, we thank you for your mercies and your grace. And we just ask that this verse, John 3, 16, that tells us that you so loved us that you gave. I believe, that, I hope that we would be challenged by that today, that we would give to each other, that we would give to other people because of our love for them and out of a remembrance for what you did for us, out of an appreciation for what you have done and what you have given to us. And we thank you for that gift. We thank you for the free gift of salvation, for the free gift of eternity that we didn't earn, that we've done nothing to achieve, but that you decided to just give over to us as you gave your son to die on our behalf. 
Let us not forget this verse, but Lord, let us take it today. Let us internalize it. Let us personalize it. Let us leave here ready and challenged to go and take this verse to other people that need to know the love of God. And let's not just tell people about the love that you have for us, but help us to show them. Help us to put it on display for the rest of the world, for the rest of this city to see and understand. We thank you, God, simply for who you are. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and that you would come to this earth on our behalf. Thank you for your love. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.